The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the third part of the second movement of Symphonie Fantastique by Berlioz. We left off with this gorgeous long statement of the E-Day fix, beautifully reinterpreted as a waltz. This is un ball, right? So it is a fancy dress ball, very aristocratic, very sophisticated, and yet we heard the power of that E-Day fix coming back and sort of shining brightly out of the darkness. And now Berlioz has to work his way back to the ball from this one moment of obsession that Berlioz is experiencing or is expressing through the eyes of his imaginary artist. So this is this really reminds me of like a modulatory passage, right? It's a, <clears throat> it's a place where the composer has got to get back to the main theme, right? So they're going to work their way back with, you know, semi-melodically, but almost more like just a chord progression. So here we have this chord here in the uh, strings. <clears throat> And the voicing is quite interesting here. We've got the cellos and violas doubling on this G natural. And then seconds on the E, firsts on the B flat. <clears throat> and throughout this, you can sort of see that the whole idea of the strings repeating notes is, uh, is going onwards, but the voicing is changing, right? So here the violas and cellos are going to octaves and so on it it things move around and and the the chords become more and more intricate i feel but it's all still very simple uh, harmonic voicings so while the <clears throat> while the strings or after the strings after the strings play this right on top of them, right after them, we see the flutes and clarinets just repeating these B-flat octaves. And I feel there's something really wonderful about that idea. Harmony in the strings repeated by just straight octaves in first flute and first clarinet. And they jump down to E and then as they hit that E, we see the E flat, <clears throat> excuse me, the E horns come in playing E as well, right? So it just sort of takes over that note. It's the same basic note that the clarinet is playing right here, that the, um, that the first horn is playing. <clears throat> and from the very beginning, we see this C horn playing that same note as well, E down an octave from where it's scored. <coughs> so, this is kind of fun, just that E is gaining pressure and, uh, and gaining in fullness as more and more is added to it, right? So, just the straight E above middle C, then an octave, piano crescendo, poco a poco, and then this E is doubled by the second horn, and eventually the first horn adds itself to it. So there's really a lot of weight on this lower E, E below middle C. <clears throat> and isn't it interesting that we have 
pianissimo diminuendo, and we also have the strings going diminuendo underneath these horns that are just starting to blaze. <clears throat> it's interesting too that we've got diminuendo, right, and then when the second clarinet comes in, it's also marked pianissimo, so it must not have been, you know, even though we've got diminuendo and a hairpin marked, Berlioz must not really be all too serious about the winds being all that soft, like, you know, not down to quadruple P or anything like that. Well, one of the aspects here of, one of the <clears throat> consequences here of the crescendo getting bigger and bigger and bigger is that it really just starts to drown out everybody else who's doing anything, right? And I think Berlioz intends that. He, he wants this big burst of color from the horns uh, to just swallow everything else up, almost as if, like, the lights of the ball, the, that sort of brightness is just sort of starting to burst out and the fantasy is now over um, of the artist seeing his... Um, <clears throat> seeing the object of his desire at the ball. Uh, now it's sort of time to get, come back to reality. And then right here, everybody comes in fortissimo. Which is soon joined by the strings right on the downbeat. So let's take apart this chord just for fun, because every once in a while it's kind of neat to check out the voicings. And there isn't a whole lot else going on here. I mean, we'll we'll talk about this too, but um, it's, you know, once you have the knack of what's going on here, it just kind of goes on the same way, right? <clears throat> so without too many implications that and, and aside. So we'll take some of this time that I've set aside for this lecture just to look at how this voicing is working. So first of all, you know, double basses, cellos, and octaves, a higher E, right, than, than they could possibly go, right? They could, they could be playing very, very low, like the rock bottom E of the standard double bass, and then the cellos on their lowest E. But Keeping the basses up is something that Berlioz does when he wants a brighter sound, and you should too. So this note right here is being doubled by the fourth and second horns, right? If you remember your transposition. Now, getting higher, we've got... <clears throat> the E that is, you know, um, above middle C. And this G here, what is that? That's B below middle C, right? It's kind of interesting that we have tunings in horns that are just dependent, excuse me, they, we have voicings in horn harmonies that are dependent on the tuning of the natural horn and you might end up with combinations that are very different from the standard one three two four kind of voicings that we see in um, in today's horn scoring <clears throat> so that basically you know, I'm, what I'm trying to say here <laughs> is that we've got an e fifth that is based off of this E, you know, with a lot of support on that lower E. And then for the E above middle C, we've got that note doubled by the second clarinet. And then, of course, up a fifth from there is sounding B, uh, written D. And filling in this fifth right in here, <clears throat> we've got G sharp and B played uh, as a double stop by the violas. And then those same two notes are also being picked up by the second violins. Now, once again, this is like a really easy double stop. If you can get the G-sharp third <clears throat> on the 
second and third strings and then play the E as an open note. And notice how barely is saying, oh, just tie the top two pitches because of course you're going to let go of the G sharp. So the G sharp already being held by the violas as part of their double stop. We don't have to worry about that too much. I mean, it's a little weaker than it could possibly be, but it still works fine with a good string section. And you also have the first violins hitting that same G sharp as they jump up here to play this E octave and so on. Now, today's players would very easily play this E octave and then tie it to this E, which is a wonderful sound, by the way, just the sound of the, the rest of the strings kind of letting go and having this one E on top of here as the, as the melody just starts to do its thing. <clears throat> However, I, I get the feeling here Berlioz was just intending for the G sharp sixth to kind of hit and then be let go of uh, as the top E continued on. But, you know, most players would just hold the E octave because that's really easy. All right, so we've got our E octave in here, whether Berlioz intends it or not. So what is filling in? We've got an E third uh, based off of this same E, right? E and G sharp. And then, of course, the G sharp underlined by the uh, solo oboe. And <clears throat> that's enough to bring out that major third, I feel. Um, you know, with the violas here, the oboe and first flute, that that is going to be enough of a sort of sound of major. And of course, with this great big dominant chord, not dominant seventh, but dominant chord, Berlioz is just setting up the return to A major, right? So just a very simple 5-1 progression. So 5 to 1 here. <clears throat> and we're going to restate the melody. Notice how the second flute is kind of taking over here and doubling the melody just for three notes in the second violins and ending up on this A. So it's just a very natural motion walking downwards and that A is just doubling for also just a just a one single note. Okay, we'll talk about the winds in a second, but first let's just talk about this melody because it's so lovely. I mean, and it's such a simple idea isn't it? To have a triple octave um, and yeah it's just just basically doubling in a triple octave right here. So um, everything about it right is just the same right and, and notice <clears throat> just the smoothness of the of the scoring. Uh, this some of this might be corrected by the concert master or by the um, section uh, principles, because if you'll recall uh, the first time that this was played by the first violins, it was da 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 da. da. You know, it's like the, there's a Berlioz is giving the player uh, is telling the player to go down bow and then up bow on the last note and then down bow up bow down bow up bow right so that it's just you know. But if you listen to players who are doing this um, exactly as Ber how Berlioz uh, suggests it, you get this nice up bow right in here, and then down bow for the whole bar, up bow for the whole bar, down bow for the whole bar, up bow, right? And it works out really, really well. And then here he goes back to like smaller bows, right? You know, down, up, down, up, down, up. Right, and that and that has a wonderful smoothness to it. So it's absolutely intentional that there are different bowings inherent in the way that these slurs are being scored here. Now, before I get to anything else, I just want to mention that what's lovely here is that instead of motion in the bass, we have like a drone, right? Or a pedal point, right? So the we've got this pizzicato just plucking away on an A, and that is such a cool harmonic idea, right? The 
harmonic changes are really being left to the winds, right? So they're they're kind of stating they're they're taking this kind of rhythmic idea of dot dot dot, which we sort of saw in the build up to this, and they're using a fragment of that as um, you know going forward as the pulse, right? Along with the along with the double basses and cellos, but also to infuse harmony, like a harmonic context into each bar. <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, there's kind of no need to really pick through these voicings. They're all really simple. Uh, uh, this solo oboe doubling the first uh, flute and so on. And then, you know, we've got the second flute just kind of playing the fifth and then you know and then playing whatever harmonies are necessary from that point onwards and yeah don't forget like this would be an e right so whatever is a c in in any uh whatever is a c in any tuning is the tuning note right so if the if the tuning of the natural horn is in e and you read a c that's an e right so in this case down a sixth and then our clarinets are are playing a C major third. That would be an A major third, right? It's the, it's the same basic concept here. <clears throat> so yeah, you know, kind of close harmonic voicings in the in the winds, and uh, and you know, then supported from below by the horns. It, pretty basic scoring, really. And there's one last little detail, and that's this badea, badea, and you know, then ending with right on the bat, downbeat, da da, boom, da da, boom, and um, that just adds this beautiful little swirl of energy. And what's great is that it, you know, it sort of punctuates the sort of dead space, uh, following the winds and horns uh, playing their little you know, bum, 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 so bum, 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 da, da, bum, 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 da, da, and so on. And, and that, you know, just along with the pulse of the pizzicato below, you get this wonderful driving energy. It's, it's really, it's like that smooth motion that you would see in a ballroom where everybody is waltzing and they're just really getting into it. And, you know, we've, we have spent some of our time here analyzing these fairly simple but very effective elements. And when we look at the next screen, we can kind of see that like there is no big change here except for the addition of the second harps. Remember, there are uh, double harps, right? So there are two first harps and two second harps. So we're adding the second harps and it, you know, just very simple arpeggiation and notice that the left hand of the harpist is actually playing the the baseline motion right while the pizzicato <clears throat> lower strings are not they're just kind of playing the drone so yeah so that adds some more harmonic context and the harmony climbs a little but it isn't really getting all that much higher right uh, there, there isn't a huge amount of change going on here it's just more like just straight dance music almost like pop music that we would hear today with the band grooving through the verse right <laughs> so <clears throat> so we're hearing the verse of the pop song with a beautifully uh, produced <laughs> uh, background to the singers in this case which it would be the middle strings And um, something that I did not point out before, and that was the um, the Divisi cellos of the <clears throat> the Divisi cellos, in which case you know there are like half the half the cellos are playing the pizzicato, and the other half are playing the uh, melody along with the violas and seconds. So um, apologies for leaving that out. <clears throat> So, I mean, that's all pretty easy, I think, to score, read, and understand, and everything else. So let's jump back, all right? We've gone over all of this stuff, so it's fresh in your mind. So I don't think I need to say, listen for this and listen for that. 
this is a really beautiful rich chord so just you know listen for that and how it lets go going into the second bar after M and just we'll just start right here and you know listen for the horns getting really big and blazing and kind of drowning out everybody else sort of more or less and just this beautiful sneaky way of getting back to E major so that that can serve as the dominant to the coming tonic of A. All right, and I will see you in a couple of minutes for the second half of this lecture. So what you probably noticed about the last screen was that it was kind of hard to hear those second harps, right? They didn't quite stand out of the texture very much, but I mean, they did provide some energy and some filling in of the harmonic spectrum, but you know, they didn't really stand out all that much. And I think Berlioz is very much aware of that because on this screen, he kind of highlights their um, their presence by leaving them lots and lots of space. So we've got crescendo, you know, piano crescendo. We've got piano crescendo uh, winds right in here, and we've got pizzicato and so on, but no horns, right, from that point onwards. So that really allows the color of the harps to come through. And it's one of the sad things because they're both such beautiful instruments, but horns and harps, I mean, they can go together, but there's something about the overtones of the horn timbre that kind of tend to swallow the beautiful glittering quality of harps. So, you know, when, when the horns are just really exposed along with the harp, it's you know, it's sort of hard. This is a funny thing, just a side note, that uh, that is not the same case for trombone. Uh, a friend of mine is a trombonist here in the Wellington area, and he had a, a harp plus trombone duo, and he scored a bunch of music for it. Really just gorgeous. Some of it was um, arrangements of other classical works and and some of it were, were his own compositions and especially when he played his alto trombone it was just gorgeous it, you know you you would have thought that the two instruments were absolutely made for each other but I feel that the same results wouldn't exactly be as satisfactory say with solo horn and, and harp well you know maybe I'm a little bit wrong in here but in the orchestral sense right of like especially like um, a section of horns or two horns kind of playing uh, repeated harmonies or holding a, a chord. I think it sort of sucks a little bit of color out of the out of harp in this way, symphonically speaking. So here the harps just really are allowed to shine. And you can see that uh, there is octave doubling, right? Right here we have the second harps going an octave above the first harps. And then we can see they're changing to um, like thirds and so on. And it, yeah, it's, it's just really, really nicely done. And once again, Berlioz is sticking to a single action harp type um, uh, level of, of pedal changing, right? Just, you know, E sharps rather than, um, or, or and D sharp rather than, sorry, E sharp and, rather than F natural, D sharp rather than E flat. Um, F natural wouldn't be a problem except for the fact that A, it really is an E sharp, harmonically speaking, and B, we've got an F sharp coming up right here. Right? So um, <clears throat> so it, it, it all works out pretty well, and there, you know, there's really 
nothing to nothing to worry about for a single action harpist, right? Which um, you know might have been what he was stuck with sometimes, or what what the performers were stuck with. And it really is beautiful, glittering, just so sophisticated. I mean, you can almost see the big chandeliers <laughs> in the ballroom. Uh, yeah, just the vibe is, and it's so intoxicating. And, and when it's done well, it really does grab at your attention and kind of distract you from everything else that's going on here, which is a simple but potent idea. I mean, a genius simplicity in a way and that is this uh, you know I mean despite like or without mentioning the pizzicato right in here okay and that is that you've got this repeated harmony here in our winds right and as they go we up 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 uh, right we've got the strings coming in poco forte and they diminuendo a little bit. I would say probably down to like, say, right here it's marked piano, right? So, you know, or maybe maybe mezzo piano by the way of our kind of, you know, the way that we think of dynamics today. <clears throat> and as the strings sort of fade out slightly, the winds push in, and so you have this wonderful kind of lucid quality to the harmony as the strings continue on, right? And Berlioz does that again, right? Uh, as the as the the melody for like this this kind of wind down after the main theme, uh, which is really is the same thing that happened at the beginning, of course, orchestrated very differently. Uh, the winds come right back in. And as they do their repeats, you've got the da 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 bum winds increasing again and then of course that wonderful harmony singing over the strings as they continue on da, 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 da. right um so just yeah it's just such a great idea i mean yeah every once in a while berlioz pulls something out that is just amazing and is so different from any other orchestrator of his time i, I feel that this this is just this is modern orchestration that we're seeing right in here. It is not an adaptation or an enlargement or uh, this the change of scope of something that was around in his day. It just really is something original. And yeah, I just think we should really credit him with that ingenuity. And you just going from flute solo with the clarinets and harmony, uh, walking up to here. Now, this is a little deceptive. We're seeing an E sixth here in the flutes with the uh, C sharp being doubled on top by the oboe. And we have an E sixth here in our A clarinets, written E sixth, but that is a C sharp sixth, right? So it's just basically, you know, forming a uh, forming an octave, the C sharp with a C sharp, right, in a sort of a six three octave chord. And then, do you remember your transposition? Think of bass clef with an E major scale, or or E major key signature. All right, so that's a C sharp third, uh, middle C sharp, and E. <clears throat> and this is a place where it's very hard to hear the harps, right? It's just the the from what I was talking about before, the the very strong quality of the horns and uh, clarinets can be part of that, you know, can be culprits as well in kind of robbing some of the resonance from the harp. But still, you know, I mean, with the if the harpists are right in front of the orchestra, then there's some chance of this coming through all right. I love the contrary motion here of the cellos, just you know running downhill as the flutes and clarinets run uphill. All right, so that whole sense of repeatedness is going to take over and we're right back to with the contrary motion in the clarinets, right? Rising up to 
to meet the little downward slurring gestures. And as that's going on, just a little bit of pizzicato in the background, almost sort of like, um, like a callback to some of the harp that we heard before, but being played by the strings. And yeah, we're, we're sort of seeing exactly the same uh, thematic materials and the same chord progression and everything else, but just, of, of course, um, orchestrated differently. Now, a lot of the elements that we saw before are coming back. <clears throat> you know, C, 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 B, and then the um, then the answer B, 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 C, only done with the second violins and the violas, right? So they're kind of going back and forth, just the same way <clears throat> that the uh, horns were interacting with the winds in when this previous passage the the first statement of this passage you know, which sort of sets up the the reiteration of the melody <clears throat> so yeah so it's just really effective to have it done with the strings and have the winds kind of have a conversation with the first violins and if that weren't enough, uh, we've got the cellos playing at a uh, at two octaves below the uh, flute and clarinet, and flute and clarinet this time doubling at pitch, not playing octaves. And that is a beautiful sound, not used all that much up to that point. So listen for that quality. So if you're wondering, oh, what you know, is it okay to double flute with clarinet? It absolutely is in a certain range, right? So if the flute gets too low, um, say the clarinet's throat tones with the with lower flute and then getting down to the shallow register with the very lowest notes of the flute, then the clarinet will def definitely dominate. However, here in the flute's upper middle reg register, it's it's quite easy for these two instruments to play together and have a wonderful blend. All right, so ending with a little bit of a harp roll here in the second harps. Uh, and once again, da 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 ba 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 bum. All right, another roll, this time from the first harps. Pizzicato from the strings in that held high D. <laughs> and the the winds are coming in here to answer winds and horns and then walking down ba 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 da 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 dum really just coming back to that same idea right um like going to the four chord and then uh back to a one and then a five and a one right except here uh berlioz decides that he's just going to be kind of quirky and He's got this da 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 and just a general pause, kind of pulling the rug out from under the dancers. And this is something that a dance band, I guess you would call it, or a little dance orchestra might do at a ball like this. They might have places where they would um they would end a phrase like this where just the music would suddenly stop and the dancers would kind of wait. They're musicians not really exerting control over the dancers but just giving them something interesting to do or something different to do besides just going um pa pa all the time and just moving their their feet around and so on and it's just really lovely the 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 kind of chirpiness of the music right in here not just high register flute and um slightly higher thinner notes on the oboes, but also just the harmonization with the clarinets and octaves. Um, keeping in mind, this is something that I keep reminding people of, and that is if you score clarinets and octaves, they they kind of reinforce like the 
the octave in the clarinets, while it, it doesn't build octave upon octave the way that other instruments would do, the octaves reinforce each other in the overtones above the clarinet. So that kind of adds this extra element um, of, I mean, I don't want to say piercingness or, or shrillness, that's the wrong word, but just spiciness. There's a kind of a spiciness to the overtones above, right? At which I use the word piquant, right? Um, it, it stands out a little bit, it cuts a little bit into the ear, right? But that's, I don't like the word shrill because shrill has really negative connotations and this is a positive feature if it's used right as it is here right <clears throat> so there's a <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> so there's a certain kind of chirpiness implied right here right and the clarinets being in octaves kind of below the flute and oboe really helps that. And then of course, right here at the end, piccolo comes in, it's changed to petite flute, right? So we got the E, which would be E above this G sharp going up, right? And then everything just, <clears throat> and then everything just comes to this beautiful stop, this kind of expectant pause. Sometimes a, <clears throat> Sometimes a pause can can be really impactful, right? And and that is the situation right here. All right, so listen for all of those things. Listen to how the clarinet octaves are making everything be very kind of, you know, I use the word chirpy, but, um, you know, just very bright. Um, and, you know, just the, the combination of the strings here being very rich along with the horns and then dying away and just leaving this beautiful lonely color right in here. I think that that's also wonderful. Uh, the first violins leading things around with the help of the uh, winds kind of backing them up. A bit of a roll on the harp with the pizzicato in the other strings, which we also saw right here in these two bars from Q. And then, of course, you know, the da 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 uh, going on between first violins in first violins and uh, flute clarinet doubling with uh, the cellos doubling from two octaves below. And the ba 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 da 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 happening between the seconds and the violas we're just working really really great with different instruments right just just such a simple idea when you think about it but very artfully put together like no other composer would have thought of to that point then of course you know with the little harps. Listen to see how well the harps come through here. And, you know, you'll probably hear that they kind of struggle to be heard over um, this big chord. And, yeah, just, you know, this kind of fun idea. Once again, clarinets and octaves making things very, very bright above in the other winds. And pizzicato in front of that. Listen for the little contrary motion here from the cellos. And then, of course, these glittering harps playing harmonies and octaves and so on with each other. It's just so wonderful. But don't let that distract you from the really important thing happening here in the uh, between the winds and the strings. How the... <clears throat> The winds sort of push at the, these harmonies and then push into this forte right in here and that forte chord provides just a wonderful harmonic backdrop for the strings which kind of do the opposite they start kind of play poco forte so just a little under forte and then kind of let go and come back in as their melody becomes more prominent and same thing happening here it's just such a wonderful effect. Okay, so 
I hope that is enough to keep you busy studying for the next wee while. Uh, not sure when I will be coming back to these lectures. Um, I was I had hoped to continue on with them, so at least on Patreon you'll be getting them kind of in a row. But I'm not sure if I'll be able to do that because um, a bunch of stuff just happened. I think I'll I'll leave a, a commentary why uh, on Patreon. Um, but I'm it's still going to end up with a lot of great stuff for you guys and uh, including a new edition of 100 orchestration tips which you know people who have gotten it as a complimentary book may want to get the second edition copy and of course I'm happy to um, I'm happy to supply it so um, <laughs> thank you so much everybody I'm right here at the end of February, and uh, a lot of stuff has just really happened quickly um, and has been good for my career just as a composer as well as an educator for you guys, and I'm very grateful for that, and I'm so grateful for your support. Um, you know, thank you to everybody at whatever support level, you know, whether you have just been able to put a couple bucks into each video or have contributed quite a lot over the past years. Um, you know, you guys are all very special to me and I'm so grateful. And, you know, I'm thankful that I'm able to sit down in front of my computer and talk about this stuff because I feel it's so important to art in general, you know, not just <clears throat> not just specifics, um, little orchestration tricks and things that you can use, but you know there has to be some kind of perspective brought into art. I feel every generation needs to kind of think about it and contribute something to it, and this is my attempt to do that. So thank you all very much, and I hope to see you not too long from now, but it might be a couple of weeks before I can do another one of these lecture videos on Patreon, but I, I have no idea what the public release is going to be like, so just disregard if you are listening to this um, uh, just, you know, on, on its public release. Thanks all. See you soon, hopefully.